The next era in public health that we're going to look at is called the contagion control era and it spans approximately 1880 through the 1940s. The focus of this era is on germ theory. So at this point we now have microscopes. We can see things that are naked, uh, eye cannot see, and scientists saw germs and they were able to demonstrate that these germs were the origin of infectious disease. So the action framework was to control infectious disease through either environmental control, through vaccinations. Uh, sanatoriums are, are facilities where, say, individuals with tuberculosis may have been taken um, to get some fresh air, and also outbreak investigation in the general population. Some notable events are the linkage of epidemiology, bacteriology, and immunology to form tuberculosis sanatoriums, and also outbreak investigation. So I have a few videos that we'll watch that um, highlight some individuals that are key players in these areas, but the epidemiology was being practiced in the hygiene era. And then once we had the identification of germs and bacteriology, um, there were linkages that were being made so that we could come up with interventions that aided the population. Another very important event during this era is the establishment of the American Public Health Association. This is a professional organization and it is the big player in public health in the, in the United States. So let's take a look at the American Public Health Association's webpage. This is the first organizational webpage that we're going to view. Um, throughout this course, there will be many others, things like the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Healthy People 2020, but I want to make sure that you are familiar with some of these big players in public health. So the American Public Health Association is a large organization, um, covers a lot of different areas within public health. They have a very large convention each year. You can see this year it was in Philadelphia. If you continue in public health, I hope you have an opportunity to attend at some point in time. It's a very large convention. So here you can see under topics and issues. Let's look at chronic disease. So here you can see in chronic disease, they have links to a lot of other information. Um, the MMWR is from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And so this is a great website, a great organization with regards to public health. So the first gentleman that we are going to learn about is Louis Pasteur. Now, if you drink milk in this country, um, unless you go to Sprouts or Mothers and get raw milk, you will find that it's pasteurized milk. And that is because of a technique developed by Louis Pasteur um, a French chemist and microbiologist, and um, he discovered that if you heat a liquid, not to the point of boiling, and then let it cool, it destroys the germs that cause disease while preserves the fluid that you are heating. Um, he actually originally used fermentation with regards to alcohol. So it's now used commonly for a lot of different things in terms of making sure that what we consume is healthy. So let's watch a short video about Louis Pasteur. First up, the guy whose name you'll find on nearly every gallon of milk at the grocery store, Louis Pasteur, the founder of germ theory and the father of microbiology. Born in rural France in 1822, as a kid, Pasteur was more interested in art than science, earning a Bachelor of Arts before turning his focus to chemistry and physics. He liked the idea of putting science 
science to practical use in industry, and some of his early work focused on figuring out how to better manufacture wine. Hey, it was France. Of course, people had been making alcoholic beverages since practically forever, but it was Pasteur who gave us our modern understanding of the fermentation process. He showed that it's the action of living, multiplying microorganisms, specifically yeast, that turns sugar into booze. That might be common knowledge today, but back then, people didn't know much, if anything, about microbes. There had been some speculation about what we now call germ theory, the idea microorganisms might cause some diseases and make food spoil. But the prevailing scientific theory of the time was something called spontaneous generation, the notion that some organisms just sort of appeared out of thin air or came to life from decaying organic matter. Now, I'm not kidding, but for a long time people thought that baby mice came out of decaying hay and maggots were born from rotting meat. And even after those specific things were disproven, people still believed that spontaneous generation was a thing under certain circumstances. But not Louis. Building on the work of an 18th century Italian physiologist named Lazzaro Spallanzani and others, Pasteur conducted what ended up being one of the most important experiments of all time. He boiled some broth in a swan-necked flask, effectively sterilizing it, so there were definitely no breeding bacteria or anything. The container allowed filtered air to enter the flask, but would catch any microbes in the bend of the neck. Then, he waited. And nothing happened. The broth never spoiled, meaning microbes weren't just appearing out of thin air. But if he tipped the glass so that the broth touched that filtering point in the neck that was catching all the microbes from the incoming air, the broth quickly began to go bad. That one simple experiment showed that life didn't just spontaneously appear out of nothing, but there were microbes in the air all around us. Basically, he proved that germ theory was real. With his newfound understanding of microbes in hand, Pasteur hit the bottles again, experimenting with techniques to keep wine and milk from spoiling. Then in 1862, he found that heating up wine without actually boiling it would still kill bacteria and keep it from spoiling. That's the process we now call pasteurization, and it's still used today to protect and preserve a number of foods like milk and other dairy products. By this point in his life, Pasteur was in his mid-40s, and he wasn't doing too well health-wise. He had a stroke and ended up partially paralyzed. But even so, he continued his experiments and went on to invent the first laboratory-developed vaccine for chicken cholera. He then went on to create vaccines for more diseases like anthrax and rabies. Another individual who contributed to public health uh, was a Jewish physician, Dr. Joseph Goldberger, and what he did is he advanced the scientific recognition between poverty and disease. Uh, he worked and studied the causes of a disease called pellagra, and his hypothesis was that it was due to nutritional deficiencies, not to infection. So he worked for the U.S. Public Health Service at the time, and here's a short video that shows what he did. The United States Public Health Service has sent Dr. Joseph Goldberger to the South to deal with an outbreak of a new disease, pellagra. It's believed to be highly contagious, spread by germs that pass easily from person to person. No, 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 it's fine, my dear. Don't be scared. You can't hurt me. I've caught a disease or two in my time. I'm a hardy fellow for a northerner. Pellagra is generally known as the four Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. When someone gets pellagra, it usually starts off with lethargy and weakness, and it progresses to dermatitis, which is lesions which occur on the back of the hands. In the later stages, patients become demented and often die from the disease, and those that don't die are often left with an incurable dementia. In the U.S., pellagra starts with a single case in Georgia in 1902. It appears from nowhere and spreads rapidly to prisons, orphanages and hospitals throughout the South. By 1914, there are tens of thousands of cases. Thousands of people have died. Goldberger and his wife set up home in Mississippi so he can figure out the cause of this devastating epidemic. How is it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it should be obvious. Water? No, it can't be. If it was water, it would be in geographical clusters. No, Joe, I mean, do you want water? Oh, God. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not water, though. Pellagra. No, it's not food, either. Nothing's poisoning them. Everyone else seems very certain it's contagious. No, 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 no. That's just foolish. People in daily contact with pellagra aren't catching it. I don't know why I even wrote it on the board. Sit with me a little. Hmm. 
Eight. If you don't eat, you get sick. You are a genius. It would fit perfectly. My God, I've been so dull. <laughs> it's what they're not eating. It's diet. It has to be diet. Goldberger introduces milk, protein, and vegetables to the corn-heavy diet in some orphanages and asylums. Pellagra begins to disappear from these institutions. You're doing really well. So you can see pellagra is something that's caused by a deficiency. When he provided milk to those that weren't getting it, they got better. Um, whereas with uh, John Snow, he looked for geographical clusters and found it was something in the environment. Goldberger knew that wasn't the case. But if you um, were listening, you heard that the pellagra incidents were in orphanages and prisons, places that were not well off, places where you might consider poverty to be um, an overriding determinant. So this was important in terms of the progression of public health. And when we did talk about the determinants of health, it will become more clear to you.